You guys want to have church? You guys ready for church? Huh? I'm trying to talk to you. But I know you're all chatty Cathy's and you like that, so. All right. Did everybody have a good day today? Get all your chores done? No? Who said no? <laughs> well, you got a few of them done, though, right? Oh, there you go. There you go. All right. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we will get started here. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity once again, Lord, to just come together, open your word together, and just learn about you, Lord. What a blessing it is to do that, and uh, Lord, it never gets old. We want to feed upon you. We want to we be touched by you. We want to learn about you, and we're so thankful, Jesus, that you chose to come and to die for us on the cross, that you took our place on that cross, that you paid our debt, and uh, tonight we're here to honor you for that. Lord, as we open your word together, speak to our hearts, Lord. Um, show us the, the nuggets that are hidden within these scriptures. And we ask that, Holy Spirit, you would teach us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me okay? All right. Turn my, do I need to turn the speakers on? I know. Do you want to hit that switch for us? They, they can't hear me because all your fans going up there. That's okay. I don't want you to melt into a puddle. All the heat goes up in that room up there from here. It's like, really? Um, oh, here we go. There we go. Good job, Lonnie. The official switch flipper. <laughs> okay, awesome. Now you can hear me. Lonnie? Yeah. Okay. He doesn't do anything around here anyway, so he might as well do something, right? All right, you guys. Open up with me to 1 Kings chapter 21. I'm going to continue our study tonight in this book of Kings, and we're getting real close to finishing this one up, and then we'll pick up 2 Kings and just keep moving through. A lot of the stories that, um, well, the stories that we're reading now and studying now, they kind of, a lot of them, you'll hear a prophecy, and then Within First Kings, you don't quite see that fulfilled, but then when you get to Second Kings, you find the fulfillment of, of some of the other prophecies. But some of the uh, prophecies that were given in chapter 20 and in chapter 21, um, they will be fulfilled within these chapters. So it, it, it's a, a situation that happens really quick. So let's, let's just read down through here. Chapter 21, verse 1, it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near, next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than that. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. So here's uh, good old Ahab, king, husband of that wicked Jezebel, right? Um, and, you know, he must be bored. Some time has gone by. It came to pass after these things. I love that statement because I, I always remind people when you're going through tough times, it came 
to pass. It will pass. It did come, but it will pass eventually, right? It came to pass after these things. So here we have this king uh, spying out Naboth's little vineyard. And, you know, it really speaks uh, volumes about, well, we've seen a lot about Ahab already, but this is just one more character flaw where this man is so lazy um, he, he wants his little vegetable garden right next door so he doesn't have to do any traveling to go anywhere, right? And, of course, uh, Naboth, uh, his little vineyard was right there next to the house. So he goes to him and he tells him, look, I'll give you a bigger, better vineyard. And, you know, that's just like the enemy too, isn't it? So many times, you know, God's blessed us with what we have. And so many times the enemy will come along and say, you know what? If you'll do this, I'll give you something better and bigger, right? All you have to do is just compromise a little bit. And uh, Naboth is being tempted to do the very same thing here. Ahab is a very evil man. So in verse 3, Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. And by the way, there was a law, I believe it is in Leviticus, um, that um, it banned the idea of selling inherited property. It was against the Mosaic law to do that. If you had an inheritance, if you had a vineyard, if you had a piece of property, you were not to sell it. You were to keep it in the family. And um, Ahab knows that. Now, of course, you know, he's a Baal worshiper um, and uh, all of these other false gods. And we have saw what happened in the uh, last couple chapters with all of that. But he also is familiar with uh, Jewish law. So he knows. Naboth knows. And so Naboth says, there's no way, God, <laughs> the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and he turned away his face, and he would eat no food. We're just going to go home and have a big pout party, pity party, because I can't get this little plot of land out my window down here. This is a king. It just blows my mind. Some of the people we see in leadership, doesn't it just absolutely amaze you, even today in our country today, when you look around, and you see the, the leaders out there, and you think, how on earth did you ever get that position, you know? Uh, I wonder about Ahab. Not a very good king. As a matter of fact, his wife pretty much ran the show. So in verse 5, we bump into her again, and it says that Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? Why are you pouting so much? You're so depressed and bummed out. And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and I said, give me your vineyard for money or else, if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered and said, I will not give you my vineyard. So that's why I'm pouting. And then Jezreel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel, like you're the king, right? Get up, arise, and eat food. Let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name. And she sealed them with his seal, what would have been the signet ring, the king's seal. And he sent, uh, she sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and sit, seat Naboth with high honor among the people. And seat two men 
scoundrels before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king, and then take him out and stone him that he may die. So, again, we get to see the, the heart of, of, of Jezebel here. She has no, uh, no qualms about victimizing people and taking advantage of people to the point where, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, there's a list that, of five things that God hates. One of those five things is bearing false witness against your neighbor. That means lying about your neighbor, telling stories that aren't true about your neighbor, or uh, setting them up. Um, we see that happening almost every day now um, with these different uh, charges. Is this, i got to just say this. Is this not an amazing time in our country's history? It just amazes me what's going on. I mean, I don't like to watch the news, and I love my wife because she says, you get one news program, that's it. After that, we're watching NCIS. We're watching something else, right? Because that news, over and over and over again, it tends to just kind of bum you out and erode you, right? So we see one group of people over here, and they're trying to, you know, file charges against the leaders over here. And then we got another group over here, and they're trumping up, no pun intended, they're trumping up charges against someone else over here. It is absolutely insane. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So she's going to trump up charges against Naboth for something that he never did. As a matter of fact, if Naboth did anything, he was a man who was obeying the law. He was a man of honesty, and he was just telling Ahab the truth. So in verse 11, the men of the city, the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of, of his city, did as Jezebel had sent them, had, had sent them to do as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. So they proclaim a fast. They seat Naboth with high honor among the people. He's probably wondering, what is going on? You know, I just had an argument with the king, and they're putting me in this place of honor. There's got to be something that's not right. I wonder if he just kind of had a sense that something was going to happen. And in verse 13, it says there's two men. They're scoundrels. I love that. They came in and they sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him and against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. And then they took him outside the city and they stoned him with stones so that he died. This guy was framed discredited, and then executed. You know, the law demands that you have two or more witnesses if you're going to make a case. So that's why they drum up these two guys, these two scoundrels, to come in and make up charges against Naboth um, that would be very sensitive to the Jewish people. You know, the Jewish people are very sensitive about the name of their God. They're very sensitive about blasphemy. Um, and, and so it's, it's easy to see here, um, after they heard these two testimonies of these two liars, um, how they would have responded like this. They took him out of the city and they stoned him with stones so that he died. And then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. 
She doesn't tell him how he's dead, why he's dead. She doesn't give him any details. But when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Wouldn't you think that the king would say, well, what happened to him? How did this happen? Did he have an accident? Did somebody murder him? Did he move out of town? What, uh, what happened to him? Well, he doesn't seem to be very concerned about what happened to Naboth. There's only one thing on his mind right now, and he's coveting that property so much that he's obsessed with it. That's all he can think about. And so the word of the Lord in verse 17 came to Elijah the Tishbite. Good Elijah. I want to just stop for a second right there because these false charges that were brought against Naboth, who was a good man, there are even in our day today, and I, I can't help but draw these parallels because I see them so clearly. You and me in many, many circles are considered dangerous. We're considered extremists. They don't like us. They would love to take us out and stone us until we were dead to silence our voices. That's what's going on in our country today. All the voices of wickedness, they're so loud, but yet so few. And the voices of the righteous are hiding somewhere. Maybe something will shake them up. Maybe they will begin to speak out. I don't know. I hope so. So Elijah comes back on the scene here in verse 17 saying, the Lord told him, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs will lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab says to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? They don't like each other. They had an encounter earlier on Mount Carmel. Ahab does not like Elijah. Now, of course, we know Elijah's a prophet. He's a great man of God. The phrase that he uses here, we see it's a common phrase throughout the Bible. Thus saith the Lord. Very common phrase. Common phrase today that is used. Have you ever had anybody give you one of those thus saith the Lord things? Right? I've heard a few of those over the years. Thus saith the Lord. You know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and, and you're going to go through this and you're going to go through that. And I think about that and I think, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to be disrespectful or rude, but I'm just going to wait and see. Because if the Lord said it, it's going to happen, right? If he didn't say it, it's not going to happen. So we have to be really, really careful when someone approaches us and wants to give us a word from the Lord. It should always be grounded in Scripture. Always. There should be no exceptions to that. And this is truly a spiritual gift, a prophetic gift, that, that a lot of people will uh, attempt to use. But you have to always remember, if it comes to pass, then I can think that was from God. But until that time happens, I'm not going to really, I'm not going to bet on it. 
Thus saith the Lord, you're going to win the lottery, and it's almost a billion dollars, and all you got to do is go down and put a thousand bucks worth of tickets in there. That's all I got's a thousand bucks. I'll go buy all those tickets for a thousand bucks, because thus saith the Lord, right? We can get ourselves into trouble if we're not careful in some of these areas. I know that's kind of a dumb example, but it brings home the point. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you. I love that. Because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. You sold out, Ahab. You've sold out the nation. You've sold out your family and yourself. The Lord says, Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. Want to be a leader? Want to be in charge? Boy, this is quite the warning, isn't it? Even James talks to us about that in, in his letter that he wrote when he talks about teachers and people that want to be leaders and, and saying, you know, you better be careful what you say. You better make sure that what you're saying is truth because you're going to be held accountable for deceiving people. Ahab had done this on a huge scale, deceiving a whole nation. And he had a lot of help. He had his wonderful wife, Jezebel. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Sin in the camp. We've seen that over and over again on, on a small scale and on a big scale. Here it's on a huge scale. And he literally has angered God. And, you know, you don't want to make an excuse for this guy, but look at verse 25. It says all this stuff happened because Jezebel stirred him up. She encouraged him. But you know what? He's a man. He's a king. He's blessed. He knows better. And I don't know what type of power this woman must have had over Ahab, but it was a lot. It was very powerful. He was afraid of her. And he behaved abominably. That's really, 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 really bad. And so it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and he put sackcloth on his body. And he fasted, and he laid in sackcloth, and he went about mourning. He's had a change of heart, evidently, huh? He's seen the damage that he's done, and now he's scared because he knows he's angered the only true God, and that his life is on the line. And so what does he do? He repents. He goes through all the motions of repentance. And I got to tell you, 
that I think this repentant act that he does is legitimate. He truly is broken. He truly is humbled. He's mourning over his sin. And in verse 28, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. So God chooses to spare Ahab's life because he repented. Only God knows our hearts, right? You know that. I mean, we can fool all the people some of the time and whatever, however that thing goes, but you never can fool God. He knows our intentions. He knows our motives. He knows why we're here. He knows everything about us. He knows all the secret things about us. It's interesting, uh, the Bible tells us that he knows our thoughts before we even think them. Wow, that's kind of a sobering thing, isn't it? Careful what you think, not just what you say. But, you know, thoughts turn into words that turn into actions, and, and even God cannot be fooled. I don't know why he spared this king. Because he humbled himself. Because he went through the motions. Because he was broken. I wonder if he gave the vineyard back to Naboth's family. I'd like to find that one out. Usually, you know, repentance. There's another side to repentance, and it's restitution. It's a very important part of restoring our lives. If there's anything we can do to help that person that we've hurt, we should. We should find ways, if possible, to make some kind of restitution to our victims. Now, I'm not going to say that across the board, because I think there's times when it's better just to keep your mouth shut and accept the forgiveness instead of digging up all those old ghosts out of the closet, right? So I guess the, depending upon how God would lead your heart. Um, but restitution is an action that, that says, I am really, really sorry for what I've done. It's a huge part of Oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's a huge part of changing your life, proving that your life has changed. And so Ahab, he gets a pass. And uh, chapter 22, let's go ahead and move into that. It says, three years passed. So without war between Syria and Israel. You know, these guys are always going at it, and it's very unusual that you would have three whole years. Solomon enjoyed a time of peace during his reign, but just about every other king, they reigned in the middle of war. And here now, Ahab, in his uh, kingship, is enjoying peace between Syria and Israel. And then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, he went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. And so he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. We're family. You bet. I'll go with you. 
And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. You want to make this big decision. One question is, have you prayed about it? Did you go to the Lord and ask him, Lord, should I go take this place from Syria? Will you give me the victory? You know, David did that over and over again, didn't he? And the Lord would say, yes, go, take them. I'm going to give you the victory. But the king of Judah comes in here and he reminds Ahab, perhaps you should inquire of the Lord today, not tomorrow, not when we get on the battlefield, but right now. And so the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, (laughs) about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, (laughs) because he does not prophesy good things concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. He doesn't like this prophet, because he's he's not saying the things that make the king of Israel feel comfy. And uh, many, many times throughout the history of Israel, we find that the kings would gather to themselves all these prophets who were uh, basically yes men, you know. They would respond the way they know the king wanted them to respond. As a matter of fact, before Israel was carried off, um, the prophet was coming to the king saying, king, you better repent because... God says there's not going to be one stone and we're all going to lose our homes. And and all the other prophets would come in and say, oh, no, that's not what God is saying. It's all going to be okay. Don't worry. Keep planting your gardens and building your houses because it's all going to be fine. That's what the king wanted to hear. And it wasn't fine. They lost everything. They lost it all because they listened to the voice of false prophets. So the king of Israel in verse 9 called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, of course, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. All, what was it? 400 of them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Shina'ana, whew, that's a hard one. He had made horns of iron for himself. And he said... Thus saith the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they're destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So the messenger who had gone to call, Micaiah spoke to him saying, now listen, The words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. So please let your words be like the words of one of them and speak encouragement. You know, don't be so negative. You're always negative. Every time you come before the king, you got this negative bad news attitude. And all of these guys are telling the king, it's all going to be good, so... Do me a favor, just go along with it, right? And Micah said, 
or Mac- Micaiah, said, Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. I love that. That's a good encouragement for us too, isn't it? Don't go along with the crowd. There could be 400 prophets gathered around saying one thing, but if you know that it's not from the Lord, you need to hold on to what you know is true. You can't be swayed by political pressure, peer pressure, authority. And my... my, Micaiah, Micaiah, I don't even know how to say this guy's name. Micaiah said that whatever the Lord said to me, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to be really honest with you. So then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered, go and prosper For the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? He doesn't trust this prophet. Maybe he's so used to hearing the bad news from this guy that he's a little bit leery of his uh, agreeing to do this. He said, There's got to be a catch here. This guy never goes along with it. Verse 17, then he said, I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all of the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. So the Lord said to him, in what way? He said, I will go out, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail Go out and do so. My goodness, is that bizarre or what? Totally bizarre. There's this conversation going on in heaven, and this spirit comes forward, an angel, a messenger of Satan. Don't know. But he said, I'll persuade him. Because what's going to ultimately happen is this, you know, this isn't going to be the great victory that all these prophets had prophesied earlier. And now we're dealing right at the throne of God. We have this conversation going on between God and all of these spirits, angels, on his left and on his right. I wonder if this is Satan. I wonder if this is the one that stood forward and said, I'll go out and I'll put a lying spirit in his mouth. Did you know, I think it's in the book of Thessalonians in the New Testament, one of the attributes of the Antichrist and the false prophet, that they will have a lying spirit. And it says that they will do lying wonders. They're going to do the wonders 
but they're going to be lying wonders. They're going to be deception. They're not going to be coming from God. They're going to be coming from another source. Perhaps this lying spirit right here will rise up again in the tribulation and possess the Antichrist and make him a lying spirit also. Don't know, just speculating. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now, Zedekiah, the son of Shinana, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go in, when you go into an inner chamber to hide. Why would God speak through you? I'm the king here. I'm the authority here. Where did this spirit come from? Um, are you a false prophet? You're not saying what we want to hear? So the king of Israel, he said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all of you people. This is a warning. You're being led down the wrong path. You're listening to bad counsel. You can put me in prison. You can starve me. You can beat me. It's not going to change a thing. God's word is going to come to pass. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, <laughs> I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you, you put on your robes so that the king of Israel distinguished himself and went into battle. I'm going to kind of act like I'm just a soldier. I'm just going to disguise myself, you know, because I'll probably be able to hide out a little bit here. And I don't really want anybody to know who I am because if you know who I am, they're going to want my head. But you, king of Israel... Or you, king of Judah, you know, put on your robe. Let them see you. Let them see your authority. And now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariot, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. Don't worry about all those soldiers. One thing Keep it in focus. We want the king. So it was. When the uh, captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, surely this is the king of Israel. Of course. He's got his robe on. He's in his chariot. He's probably got his little crown on. Therefore, they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out, and it happened when the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. And he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in the chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound 
onto the floor of the chariot. And then as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army saying, every man to his city, every man to his own country, retreat. And so the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria. And then someone washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood while the harlots bathed according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did the ivory house that he built and all of the cities that he built are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel so Ahab rested with his fathers and then Ahaziah his son reigned in his place so the word of the Lord did come to pass for Ahab the dogs did lick up his blood he was killed Interesting, isn't it, that God had given him the opportunity when he repented to listen to his word. He gave him a chance to do the right thing. I'm really glad that we have a lot of grace in our lives, aren't you? I'm really glad that God gives us as many chances as we need, right? It's not three strikes and you're out. Boy, some of us would have been out a long time ago if that was the case. But God is so merciful. God knows the end before the beginning. He knows exactly what it took or what it takes to bring us to that place where we would put sackcloth on and fast and mourn and have a change of heart. Anybody ever get saved and baptized and then a few years later you find yourself right back out in the world again. I know a lot of people like that. I'm one of those people. But God in his foreknowledge, he knows the end before the beginning, thankfully. He knew that Ahab's heart for the moment was humbled but it wouldn't remain that way. He knew that our hearts for the moment weren't humbled, but that they would be. I think some of us could say, you know what? God preserved my life when I was out there in the world living like that. He preserved my life. I should have been dead a long time ago. It's only God's mercy. It's only God's grace that allows us to be here today. Now, in uh, uh, in Second Kings, I think it is. It tells us a little bit more information about Jezebel. What happened to her was awful. When the king came in, he saw her looking out of the window, and there was a couple of eunuchs up there with her bodyguards. And he hollered up to the window and he said, throw that woman out. And so they threw her out of the window. And she hit the ground really hard and she died. And they left her there. So the next day in the morning they thought to themselves, you know, she was the queen. We should honor her in some way. So they went down to where her body was. And all that was left was her skull and her hands and her feet. That's it. Everything else had been eaten by the dogs. Pretty incredible. Pretty, what a sight. When God speaks, he does it in detail. He doesn't speak in general. He gives us details and he says I'm going to do this so that you will know that I am the Lord 
the one and only Lord. No one can do this like I can. There's some folks that make predictions. There's some folks that do stuff like that. Sometimes they come to pass. You know, some of them were familiar with their names over history, and some of the things they said came to pass. But you got to kind of wonder sometimes if those little phrases that they made have been kind of forced to fit a certain event. But when it, comes to the, when it comes to the Lord, when it comes to Jehovah, he's very, very precise in what he says. That's why he warned these people. If you're going to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, you better be right. Because if you're not, guess what? We're going to yank you out. We're going to throw a rock concert and put you down. Because he won't tolerate the, a false prophet. It angers him. So Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, became king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king. And he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba the daughter of Shehi. And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. Also, Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and the might that he showed and how he made war, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the rest of the perverted persons, I like that, who remained in the days of his father Asa, he banished from the land. There was then no king in Edom, only a deputy of the king. Jehoshaphat made, a merchant, made merchant ships to go out to Ophir for gold, but they never sailed. For the ships were wrecked at Izion Gerber. And then Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became the king over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. And, just like everybody else, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father and in the way of his mother. And in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him. And he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. So, see a pattern? Huh? Over and over and over and over again. It's amazing, isn't it? All these kings that had all of this authority, all the, the wonders of ruling over God's people... Do you remember when they said, we want a king? And they were warned, weren't they? They said, you want a king? Well, you're going to get a king, but you know what? He's going to take your sons and your daughters and your land and your money and your possessions for himself. And he's not, gonna, he's not going to serve the Lord. He's going to be wicked. Every single one of them. Now, one of them here evidently tried to have a little bit of common sense and a little bit of revival, but nevertheless, it says, that they never took down the high places. The high places where they would go and they would have prostitutes. They would have perversion. They would have sacrifice to the gods, to Baal. 
They were never torn down. You know, you cannot just go through the motions. You got to tear them down. You got to get rid of them. You got to have a change of heart. What's it mean when we say repent? Does it mean, I'm really bummed out because I got caught? Or does it mean I'm going to change direction in my life? I'm never going to go down that path again. I'm going to turn away from that and I'm going to start walking on the path that God has for me. That's what repentance is. It's not just being sorry. It's not penance. Because, you know, we could never pay that debt anyway. But it is having a change of heart. I think that every single one of these guys had the opportunity to do that. But you know, sin and idol worship and evil, it gets so ingrained in people. And it's passed down from generation to generation. It's a pretty sad story, isn't it? And it continues to be that way throughout these records that You know, we'll meet one king here, Josiah, who's a good king. But all the rest of them, bad, evil. The people of God, really? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time tonight. It's almost depressing reading these stories. We see the, the true nature of the human being, that fallen nature, sinful nature, self-centered nature. But Lord, we don't want to be that way. Lord, we do. We do want to repent. We do want to change direction in our lives and, and, and maintain that. We want to finish the course. And we know, Lord, that you're watching over us, that your hand is upon us because we truly are your children and we're your bride and you love us with an everlasting love. And so I want to thank you for that. I'm sure each one of us in here tonight want to thank you for that. But Lord, help us not to fall into these traps. Help us not to listen to the voices that are not coming from you. Holy Spirit, give us discerning hearts that we may know when you speak and that we may move when we hear you. So thank you for our time tonight. Bless us as we go out. Lord, I want to pray for those who are sick in our little church, those who are suffering tonight with illnesses. God, I pray you be with each and every one of them, that you would raise them back up on their feet again, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.